Welcome to Theology Thursday, an ecumenical space for students to discuss matters of faith and theology. I'm your host, Connor Grubbs. And I am your co-host, Ryan Mock. And I'm your co-co-host, Johnny Grubbs. I know you're not supposed to touch your face right now, but my nose is itchy. Ooh, you know, let me scratch it for you. Ah. Stop that right now. Uh, hey, <laughs> uh, so here we are, and we are practicing proper social distancing this week. Uh, last week, Ryan was about six inches from me, and now he's much more than six feet from me because we're all in separate places doing it. Uh, hey, I'm actually, I'm actually in the podcast right now. I'm in Theology Thursday. He's in the, it's like the Matrix. Uh, so, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, this is, as I like your background. It's a nice background. Um, so we're all here. We're having a grand time. Hey, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, we have video podcasts now. So if you want to, like, watch us instead of just listening to us, you can. I'm not sure why you would, but you can. Um, and I'll also say this, uh, the, the other exciting news is we just have more content coming on YouTube now, little eight to 10 minute videos, devotionals, encouragement here and there, just different thoughts about things. Uh, so go subscribe. It's a fun time. Um, we're also on Instagram. We're on Twitter. Just, we're, we're going to try and be a little more active and a little more interactive. Next week is the season finale of season three. Um, Hard to believe we're coming up on 80 episodes pretty soon here. Uh, three seasons. It's nuts. Um, I, a lot of podcasts don't last this long. And we plan on, on to, to keep doing this till we're dead. So uh, we're, 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 we're enjoying it. And we're ho we hope you're enjoying it too. And we, we want to kind of kick things up a notch, take them to the next level. And so if you want to support that uh, and invest in that a little bit, there's going to be a link in the show notes here uh, for you to donate, become a patron of Theology Thursday. If we can get to 10 patrons, we'll do a monthly live Q&A, probably over Zoom or something like that, um, just for the patrons. Um, and we'll... we'll you know, talk about some other things as you invest that, you know, there'll be some kind of exclusive patron only content. Uh, but you're also investing in making this a better podcast and um, just uh, helping us, uh, which we would greatly appreciate. Um, but we also know that these are strange times and we don't expect you to just fork out money for a couple of idiots talking about the Bible. So with that being said, that's just a quick, quick update. We are wrapping up our systematic theology. This week we're talking about salvation, the order of salvation, kind of the, the work of the Spirit um, in our lives, and it's going to be a grand old time. But Ryan, I believe you also have a sub-point for us. All right, so I don't think we've ever done this before, but our sub-point's actually going to be a little game. This game I actually played with my, my father uh, last night. It's something that I saw on Facebook. Uh, so I'm going to screen share here. Well, and for, for this, this isn't, this is something that the audio only people will still be able to enjoy. Yes, they they could listen in. I'm going to, I'm going to verbally explain what's on the screen for everybody too. Uh, and hopefully you guys could see it fine. Okay. Do you guys see that Johnny and Connor? Yeah. yeah I see a list of names. Okay. So here, here's the prompt. You are spending the weekends at a house and there's there's six houses uh, and the houses have a list of theologians and philosophers and, and Christian thinkers uh, throughout church history so you have to choose one of that one of the six houses you're in the house you get to listen in on their discussions you're not allowed to take notes you're only allowed to, to just listen in uh, and so what you listen into throughout the weekend, that's what you take home with you. Uh, so uh, there's six houses. I'm going to explain who's in each house, and then you guys have to decide which house you would stay in. And me, me and my father, we played this game last night, and um, we, we, we sat there for an hour thinking about it because it was really tough. Well, so I, the, before you even read them, I already know which house I don't want to be in. 
but <laughs> I could probably guess. I could probably guess which house you don't want to be in. The, the other five are are difficult. Yeah. So uh, for our audio people, I'll I'll read who's in each house. House one, you have uh, Saint Augustine, you have Aquinas, B. B. Warfield, uh, Tim Tim Timothy Keller, and Cornelius Van Til. In house two, you have. Are, are we gonna give like a just a brief bio on each one? Maybe just a sentence, just to kind of. Oh, do you want do you want that? I think that would be valuable. I mean, that could take a long time. Yeah, I, I, I'm super quick for like. We need to. We will post this on our social media so yeah. people can. Um, there you go. Yeah. Oh, that'll yeah. be fun, but maybe just a lightning round of like Saint Augustine. He wrote the Confessions. Uh, all right. Okay. I'll, I'll give. Uh, I'll give all right. You yeah. That. Fair enough. All right. So, so Augustine, he was a church father. He wrote lots of books. Aquinas was a uh, a um, a theologian philosopher of the scholastic period uh, before the Reformation. He, he wrote a lot on apologetics. B.B. Warfield, he was a theologian of the 19th century. Uh, he was a reformed theologian. He wrote a lot. Timothy Keller is a modern day uh, theologian philosopher. He's wrote lots of books and he's a pastor. And Cornelius Van Til, I he is a, a Christian philosopher, thinker of the 20th about uh, presuppositionalism. The house two, you have uh, Clement, who was a church father. Uh, you have John Calvin. Oh, man. Oh, man, Ryan, you were, you were, you were lagging like a He, Christian. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm lagging. Yeah, now you are. Okay, I think I figured I probably would. That the the Wi-Fi in this house is is spotty for for stuff like this. Um, C.S. Lewis, he's a Christian writer. He wrote a lot. Christian thinker of the twentieth century. A.W. Tozer, kind of the same deal. Uh, Christian theologian. John Wesley, he was a uh, a pastor theologian of the Great Awakening. Uh, house three. This is this is a good house right here. House three, Tertullian, Church Father, Martin Luther, starter of the uh, Protestant Reformation, James White, apologist of today, is a, a modern day apologist debater, uh, Jonathan Edwards, Christian theologian, philosopher of the Great Awakening, J K J K G G K Chesterton. He was an author and a Christian thinker of the 20th century. Uh, house four, you got Polycarp, a, mar a martyr of the uh, the church fathers. John Owen, a uh, Christian uh, theologian, uh, from that traces himself through the through the Puritans uh, in the the seventeenth eighteenth century era. Uh, he wrote a lot of good books. R. C. Sproul, uh, modern day dude, probably a lot of you have already heard of him. Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. He's a, a, a well-known preacher uh, of the uh, of, of decades past. Herman Bavinck. He was reformed uh, theologian and author. He wrote a huge systematic theology, uh, and he and he's Dutch, uh, so you would have to get a translated copy of that. House five you got Athanasius, uh, church father. He did a lot of work in the church fathers, early church history. John Bunyan, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. John MacArthur, we've talked about John MacArthur before. Probably all have heard our thoughts on John MacArthur, uh, modern day Christian pastor and theologian. Ravi Zacharias, he's a uh, apologist, modern day. Uh, and Anselm, a, a church father. House six, you have Ambrose, a church father. He's kind of the mentor of Augustine. Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, 19th century. Uh, John Piper, y'all probably know John Piper is, a modern day pastor, theologian. Francis Schaeffer, another theologian. J.I. Packer, uh, theologian who's still alive today. Um, and so uh, he's, he's an Anglican, he wrote lots of books. So that, that's, that, that's six houses, a lot of theologians. You have to pick which house that you would, uh, that you would, you would stay in for the weekend. Whoever put this together did such a good job of separating certain. I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just me, but I'm looking at this and going, "Man, I wish I could mix and match." And I'm sure any way that they were done, that would be the case. But it, they're just done in such a way where it's like, "Man, that house looks really good. 
but then I would miss out on that person. Sure, there's well, a yeah, we, we a see a pattern that house. Yeah, every so, every house has a church father, uh, and every house has like a modern dude. Um, and so, yeah, they, whoever, I don't, I don't know who actually did this, but whoever did it a really good job of diversifying it. Yeah. Uh, so I'll tell you this, if I walked in house five, I would immediately tell John MacArthur to go home. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I could handle being stuck in a house with that man. Uh, yeah. House number five doesn't look too appealing to me because I mean, I, there's stuff to glean from John Bunyan. There's stuff even to glean from John MacArthur. And as much as I love Robbie Zacharias, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's, there's, not, there's not enough people. In it's strange. I'll say this about house six. I feel like John Piper and uh, Spurgeon would just be hugging the whole time. Uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> there's like, you, you have John Piper is very much uh, Christian hedonism, very poetic language. And you have Charles Spurgeon who, and you know, I could have done a whole sub point about this because I've just noticed this recently. There is a language that Spurgeon uses in his writing. And it's not all of his writing. I mean, we are talking about the Prince of Preachers, quote unquote, right? Uh, some incredible stuff. But some of it makes me extremely uncomfortable. Um, and I don't know if it was just kind of a cultural thing that it, this was more comfortable back then than it is now. But Spurgeon uses a lot of erotic language to describe our relationship with God. And it makes me extremely uncomfortable. I mean, I'm in literally saying, you know, in, in the morning and evening devotional and stuff that, you know, a lot of stuff very popular, but I'm just reading it and it's talking about having intercourse with Christ and it's, it's borderline sacrilege and blasphemous at the same, I, it's just odd. I can't wrap my mind around that kind of language being used to describe our relationship with God, but it's something Spurgeon did a lot. It's but spiritual is, intercourse, and it's not sexual, you weirdo. I don't care. I don't, care. I don't know. <laughs> the way he describes it and gets into detail, but it's just very, very odd. Um, here's the thing. House 6 is very appealing to me because I, I love um, I love Francis Schaeffer, J.I. Packer, and Spurgeon, and I can tolerate uh, much of what Piper says. I don't know they remember too much about Ambrose. But here's the thing. If I had to pick a house, it would definitely be House 2 for the sole reason of watching C.S. Lewis put John Calvin in his place about election. Oof. Really? Wow. Mm. <laughs> so, See, uh, oh, no, go ahead, Ryan. I, so I feel like House, House 5 would be just a mess because we know how, like, some of these guys are a little aggressive, right? So I feel like that house would just dissolve in chaos um, with John MacArthur particularly. And I also feel that way about house three because you have Martin Luther and James White who are both very aggressive people. I mean, if you read Luther's works, he is very aggressive and vulgar in how he how he treats people. Uh, James White, he's, I, I like James White, but he's a controversial person today because a lot of people view him as abrasive. Um, but just that, that mix right there. And then you throw in Jake, uh, GK uh, Chesterton, who is, he's, he's a cool, humble dude, but he's totally on the opposite side of the theological spectrum. And so right. he's, he's like Catholic. And so like that would, that would just dissolve in another house of, of fighting. Um, but I noticed like in each house there, there's a church father. There's also a, a modern day dude. And in each house to me, in each house, there's a throwaway dude where it's like, okay, I don't particularly care for this person or he's not as important. Right. And each house well, there's how- a controversial dude. Right. I think I think House Two would be the most civil. I think that they would like e- even with John Calvin because he he could be emphatic, but he was also very intellectual. And so I think that once they get down to the nitty gritty, there'd be a lot of discourse between C.S. Lewis and John Calvin with the other guys interjecting here and there. House Four is really interesting because um, yeah, you know, I like I, I think John Owen has some great stuff. I've been reading a lot of uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones lately. 
I had never really heard of him before, but I've been reading a lot of him lately, and, and I'm, I'm really appreciative of some of his work. I feel like with R.C. Sproul, though, um, I love R.C. Sproul, but there's like probably a year's worth of footage and audio of him preaching <laughs> available out there uh, for free even. Um, yeah, so well, what I was talking to my dad, and, and my dad's like, you know what, in House 4, R.C. Sproul would be the guy who just sits back as well and listens to everybody else speak. Right, yeah. Like that's the case, you know. Um, my pick, the house that I think that I would pick, is actually House One. Mm -hmm. So because you got Augustine and Aquinas, like two of the greatest Christian thinkers in like church history. B.B. Uh, Warfield, I, I know who he is, not too familiar with his work. So he, for, for me, he would kind of be a, a throwaway guy. Um, Timothy Keller, great thinker of today. Uh, and then Cornelius Van Til, uh, his works on presuppositionalism, would be that would create a very interesting conversation between Van Til and Aquinas because the way they did they each did apologetics was so vast different and so I think House One would have very interesting conversation. Yeah, I think I'd have to go with House One. Well, you know what? We should we should let our view, our listener, viewer, those our audience, <laughs> look at this and. <laughs> See what, see what they think if they maybe they're just like you guys are nerds I, nobody cares about this um we'll, we'll throw probably. a poll on instagram and facebook and see um yeah i mean i it, for me it's it's between those two that you guys are talking about i love tim keller i love augustine I, i'm gonna have to go with house two though there's something about the john callan c.s lewis a.w tozer that's that's an interesting combination there. And, and again, I think like you guys, it would be civil. Um, what I want to see is John MacArthur and John Wesley having a conversation. Um, I feel like that would be kind of an epic rap battle of history sort of deal. I mean, John, John Wesley was very much for, you know, women preachers. And, Dude. Uh, that That's what we need to do. And he, he some was, of our I content. Think, Ep epic theologian battles of history yeah that would be that would be interesting um but i mean i just I, he was i think one of the first um men to advocate for that that wasn't deemed a heretic i mean i don't know it would just be really interesting um so uh yeah i'm gonna go with house two uh that's it for that sub point that was fun thank you ryan yeah let me uh Stop sharing. Boom. Okay, here we are. Look at our faces. We're so cute. Um, so today we are talking about the order of salvation and, and kind of going to dig into uh, the, the Holy Spirit's uh, work in our lives. And we've talked about uh, sin. We've talked about the crucifixion and the resurrection. We've talked about the Holy Spirit even. But this is kind of, I guess, uh, a summary, uh, uh, an application of these things. What is it? mean for us so uh, there's multiple um, aspects to the salvation process and people might kind of get in debate about the order but uh, uh, Ryan if you were to kind of break it down and categorize it what would that look like okay so uh, I mean again yeah you're right uh, every but like different Christian traditions have different ideas about exactly how the order of salvation works but generally uh, there is agreement about, you know, how it works. Uh, so there, and a lot, when we're thinking about the order of salvation, a lot of the points that we're going to talk about, they happen logically in an order, in a certain order, but really they, they happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that'll, that'll become more clear as we talk about it. Um, but logically there's an order to it. But uh, I would, do you want, do you want to just jump right in and, and start with the first, the first step? Yeah. All right. So uh, the first step in the order of salvation is election or predestination. Uh, and don't be alarmed by that word because I'm going to tell you right now, every Christian tradition believes in predestination in one way or another. And yeah. so when we say that the, that the first step in the order of salvation is, is predestination, we're not, we're not excluding other Christian traditions from this uh, so, so yeah, I mean, this is this idea. Yeah, I think, I think what, even if it, if it comes in the form of 
foreknowledge or whatever. The bottom line is, in one way or another, even I believe <laughs> that God has ordained these relationships between himself and those that are saved. So there still is this idea of, you know, for believers that it, it was, yeah. Um, that, that word can be scary, but it, what, what's that? Well, well, I would just think like there, there's an idea for every Orthodox Christian of God's sovereignty over salvation. That right. So may, yeah. Explain that differently, but God is in control, and it's we don't save ourselves. Yeah, so we can all agree and so the that general, it's God's. Yeah, Go ahead. yeah. I'm sorry. Now the general idea of election is that God uh, chooses to save people. I think that 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 every Christian tradition, Orthodox Christian tradition, agrees with that. That God chooses to save people, and I'm 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 just going to leave it at that. For that, I mean, we've. Have we ever had any episodes particularly on that doctrine of predestination? Oh, yes. It was one of our first episodes yes. and also one of our longest and also one of our most listened to. Okay, very good. So, yeah, if you, want, if you want more information on that, then just see one of our other episodes. But that's like step one in the order of salvation is election, predestination, God sovereignly choosing to save people. And this is something that, that most people agree this is before the foundations of the world, before God created the world. Um, so, so now we, we jump forward in time. Uh, the, next, the next step or the next thing in the order of salvation is calling. So this is the idea that, that God calls you to himself or God, God calls us to, uh, to, to make a decision. Uh, to, in order to uh, to choose him, uh, and yes, I do believe you know everybody. Most people here on the podcast know my theological tradition um, as as reformed, but I don't deny that God calls us to make a decision. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think uh, the difference between uh, the reformed perspective and and maybe what some other people see it as is that uh, is the key thing here would be irresistible grace is that. Uh, for the Reformed tradition, when, when God calls somebody, they will respond affirmatively. Um, and God does that directly and, and individually. Um, <clears throat> whereas uh, some other people would basically put it as there's, there's a general call to all mankind to make a decision. Um, whereas in the Reformed tradition, that call is to the elect specifically. Yes. And yeah. Right. and irresistible grace when when you experience that there's only one logical conclusion it's that you will make the decision whereas you know it, if it's just a general call to all some are going to and some aren't right yeah. and, and just to clarify too i mean now that we need to i think most of our listeners know that's where i think ryan and connor and i differ i mean connor and ryan are more on that camp of if you're called you will respond with a favorable decision um I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. So, um, and, and I just want to throw a quick verse at y'all. This is, this is Romans uh, 28, Romans 8, uh, verses 29 and 30, in which Paul actually writes like a condensed form of the order of salvation. So it says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, verse 30, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. So in that verse, we see Paul given a condensed form of the order of salvation. Uh, so with that calling, let's, let's, hop, let's hop on to the, uh, the, uh, the next step in the order of salvation. So actually... This is where this next step is where people this is where this is where people really start to disagree. But uh, the way the way the reformed tradition views it is the next step uh, in in the order of salvation is regeneration. Uh, this idea that the Holy Spirit regenerates your heart. Um, and then this these two steps go hand in hand regeneration and then conversion in which you do decide to follow Jesus. Now, other traditions, and we're not going to debate it here, we're just saying it, you know, we're just laying it out for you. Other traditions would put conversion before regeneration. 
So it's for me, it would be election, call in, uh, regeneration, then conversion. And then other Christian traditions say election, call in, conversion, and, and then regeneration. Um, and that's that? created significant, that's created significant diversions too in the view on when the Holy Spirit comes into play. Because if, um, if, if uh, say, uh, you're justified before you're regenerated, some people believe you can be justified as in like you're covered by the blood of Christ, but you haven't received what some traditions would call the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? And so um, some traditions believe you can be saved for such a time without actually having the Holy Spirit. And when you flip the order, it makes that view possible. Um, but I, I'm not in that camp for sure. But but it is it is a camp. And I know many who believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes later. Yeah. Connor, if you have anything on that? No, I just think uh, sometimes that, I mean, I know we talked about not debating, but I mean, I, I'm just going to say this. I, I think sometimes that order becomes easier for people because uh, you have people who say that they're saved, um, but you don't see any fruit. You don't see any growth and there's not much change after that. And it's, well, they just haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. Um, and I think it can kind of become a cop out that we, we like add this extra step uh, when in reality, um, somebody who's saved does receive the Holy Spirit and, um, and a change does start to happen, which I think we're kind of going to get into more here towards the end. So, Yeah. And so, so just a quick de definitions, if I didn't go over it before, regeneration is when the Holy Spirit imparts spiritual life uh, to a person. Uh, or you, know, you can think of it in terms of uh, taking out their heart of stone and giving them a heart of flesh or, or creating, giving them a new heart. Uh, and then conversion is when the person uh, uh, responds to the call of gospel and repentance uh, of saving their trust in Jesus. So again, I, I mean, I would say regeneration and conversion, other people haven't switched. We're not debating that. Um, what, and then we'll, we'll talk more about this later. But the next step in the order of salvation is justification and justification is the idea of of god uh declaring you righteous declaring that your sins are forgiven and that uh you are now clothed in jesus's righteousness it's a pretty sweet trade it is it is a sweet trade for sure um we don't we don't deserve it yeah, and I, I think uh, where justification became such an important part of, um, you know, and, and this did kind of emerge during the Reformation and, and the beginning of the Protestant church, but I think whether you're Reformed or not, if you're Protestant, this definitely has, you know, carried over, um, is the fact that our works are not what save us, and we are justified by faith and grace alone, and, uh, you know, even somebody who wouldn't call himself reformed, like say Johnny here, uh, would agree that that's just biblical. We are, we are you know, justified by faith and grace alone. It's not our actions that bring about salvation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would, I would add to that, even, even though I believe in maybe a greater level of free will in the decision-making, I still believe that the ability to make a decision is only made possible um, by the spirit of Christ. And so even, even your decision is, is due to his power. And I think we would, we would agree that far, you know, it's just, it's just getting to that point where, I, you know, I look at verses about quenching the spirit and I look at the garden of Eden and I just sort of see where we can suppress the work of God in our life if we want to. But that, again, that's, that's just the other view, you know, so, but it's still his power. And, and so then after justification, the next, the next step is adoption. And this is this idea that, that God makes us uh, a member of his family. So now, now we're counted as children of God, whereas before we were considered children of wrath. Um, so now we're a part of God's family, uh, which is a nice thing. Now, the important thing to remember in all of this is that um, regeneration, conversion, justification, and adoption – this is the order, this is at least, I mean, again, some Christian tradition switches around and that's fine. This is the order in which salvation happens in a logical sense. But if you were to put these things on a physical timeline, 
those four things, regeneration, conversion, justification, and adoption, that, that all happens at the same time, right? It's not, yeah, it's not like you're regenerated and then five years later, now you're finally, your application was accepted and now you, you can be called a child of God. Now that when you are saved, you are now adopted into the family of God. That, that happens simultaneously. Right. And that's, that's an important thing that people need to note, that all yeah. those four things, regeneration, conversion, justification, and adoption, that all happens at the same time in, in a physical time frame. Right. God doesn't run on our time. So this, this might be a helpful way for us to understand the process of salvation, but it's not like they're, you know, it, 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 I think it's really important to, to note that. And I think even when it comes to kind of the difference between our understanding of time, God's understanding of time, that's all going to come into play next week when we talk again about eschatology. Um, but yeah, thank you, Ryan. So nice. Thank you. <laughs> so now uh, that th those steps, those four steps, um, regeneration, conversion, justification, and adoption, those ha all happen at a, a, a certain point. And after that uh, comes sanctification. Now, the difference between those things and sanctification is that sanctification is a lifelong process. And this is this, this process of becoming more like Christ. Right. So this process of being... Uh... Uh, set apart. And uh, I, I think uh, one thing I, I've, I've said in, in many of my sermons, and I'll continue to say it because I think it's important for Christians to remember is that while salvation is a free gift from God, sanctification requires our effort. Um, it requires our time. Uh, it requires our sacrifice. And I would say it even requires our suffering um, because to become more like God is to die to ourselves. And that's a painful process. Um, but if you're not spending time studying the word, if you're not spending time in prayer and communion with God, um, seeking after him and growing closer to him, uh, this sanctification part doesn't happen. Now, if, if you're truly saved, the Holy Spirit is there to convict you and, and draw you back into that. Um, but it, it does require some intentionality on our part. Um, and I think a lot of people, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier, it just, they're saved and okay, I'm good now. Um, and it, it just, it doesn't end there. Yeah. Right. And God still gets all the glory and God still gets all the power because what happens is, is as a believer, you're given power over sin and you're, we're commanded to wield that power over sin and no, no longer has power over us as we are believers. And we don't have to yield to every um, whim of temptation and of the flesh. And so um, that's where we're called to do it. But, but again, that, that power is given to us by God. So that's where sanctification becomes a little bit complex because is it the work of God or is it the work of us? And the answer is yes. Um, but it, it all starts with him. So yeah, it's a difficult process for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am definitely of the conviction that sanctification is a work of God, but I definitely don't deny that as Connor says, it does require effort on our parts. Remember, we can't, we can't forget what the Bible says. Like James says, you know, faith without works is dead. Uh, and so if you are a Christian, you will be uh, sanctifying. You will be, you will be, you will be maturing in Christ over time. Now, it's not it's not a a a constant stream of sanctification yet obviously you have ups and downs uh but over time you you should be maturing in Christ you should be coming becoming conformed to the image of of the son uh i think that that's something that that happens uh, from the moment you're a christian to to the day that you die it won't stop uh sanctifying so next step perseverance, perseverance and, uh, and sanctification, uh, they really go hand in hand. The idea of perseverance is that all those who are justified by Christ, all those who are Christians and follow Christ will be kept by God's power until they ultimately die. Um, so again, uh, this is particularly a, a, a staple of my tradition, my, tr my Christian tradition, the Reformed tradition, uh, because other Christian traditions have different ideas about, um, can you lose your salvation? 
in this life. Uh, some Christians uh, believe that you can lose your salvation. I don't believe that you can lose your salvation because I believe in this idea of perseverance of the saints, that uh, if God saves you, then he's going to keep you, uh, and he's not going to let you go until, until the, your ultimate glorification. And so other people have different ideas on this. The idea is that God, God keeps you uh, through your life. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, and while I differ, I think, too, like on, on what happens, like in that step of calling of when God is calling out to us in terms of where free will is involved, I, I don't see how people can tiptoe around perseverance of the saints. Um, this idea that, that we are eternally secure. Some people call that, you know, I've labeled that eternal security. You know, I, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't see how you can view view it any other way now i mean i'm not judging any of our listeners that view it differently it's just it's really hard for me um, that is one area that just seems very very much obvious to me um, i think it was yeah charles stanley wrote a great book about eternal security so if you're curious about that it's very short very easy read and it's very much like straightforward like oh <laughs> duh you know eternal security it's very good yeah and you know i think one thing that's super important I, uh, one quote that I've always loved is, is if you could lose your salvation, then you would, you know, um, <laughs> uh, we, we uh, would take care of that pretty quickly. Um, and I think it just puts too much power in our hands, uh, the, the idea that we can undo something that God went to such great lengths to do. Um, it, I, I think it's kind of an insult to Christ's work on the cross. So that is something I do take pretty seriously. So again, we love you. We want to, this is a place for students to discuss. We're students of the Bible ourselves, but most arguments that I've seen against eternal security have been more emotionally driven than they were um, biblically driven. It was, I had a brother and sister and they were definitely saved. They, they served on the worship team every week and they read their Bible every day and they love Jesus, uh, and now they're not Christians anymore. So, of course, you can lose your salvation. And unfortunately, I mean, I've talked to some very smart people, much smarter than me, who've been studying the Bible and Christians longer than me, who believe that. And the best argument they can give me is my friend or my sibling, they used to be a Christian, now they're not. I'm like, mm. but what does the Bible say? So I, and I understand that that makes it hard. I, I'm not, I'm not trying yeah. to say that um, cause I haven't been there. I haven't had an experience like that. So I, I understand, but scripture always trumps experience. Um, our, the way we interpret our, and, that, and they're both there. I, I, I don't want to, uh, theology and experience both matter. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if our experience is taking us a place that does not line up with scripture, um, we need to be really careful about that. Yeah. And, and one last thing that I would add to this idea is it's the, the, the phrase once saved, always saved is an oversimplified definition of perseverance of the saints. I don't, I don't really like that definition because what it does is it, it, it gives off the, the, the attitude that once you're saved, you could do whatever you want and you can't lose your salvation. Uh, but that, that doesn't do justice to what, what the Bible actually says about perseverance as saints. Uh, the Bible paints a picture of a Christian who, who, who wants to grow in their faith and wants to mature and wants to continue following Jesus. And if you have that attitude that, hey, I'm a Christian, uh, I could do whatever I want, then you don't really understand what being a Christian means. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I mean, I would, I would question your heart there in that. Uh, so it's important that, that we understand that perseverance of the saints, this idea of eternal security, it doesn't mean that you could do whatever you want as a Christian and then you can't lose your salvation because of that. So yeah. We need to be careful with that term. So the, the final point in our, in our order of salvation uh, is this idea of glorification. And this is when uh, God finally removes uh, all trace of sin uh, from the Christian and gives the Christian a resurrected body. Uh, and this happens, this happens after death for us when we die. Uh, 
and we go up to heaven. That's when, uh, that's when, that's when God gives us our new bodies. Um, so any, any thoughts on that? Well, actually just to clarify what, when that actually happens is after the rapture happens and Kirk Cameron was left behind to be an evangelist. Yeah. <laughs> so, some people, some people do this, this idea of, of this intermediate state uh, that we, we, we don't, we, we, we go in this somehow spiritual consciousness in the presence of God until our, our, we receive our resurrection body. So not everybody thinks that that happens, you know, right away. Yeah, no, but, definitely. I mean, and, there's, and, there's different ideas about how exactly that happens and what, what process, like what, what happens in the between. I'm not, I'm not qualified to debate on that or give my opinion on that. I haven't researched it enough. Uh, but the idea that that every Christian tradition agrees with is that yes, Jesus is going to come back, and uh, when when Christians go to be with Jesus, we're going to have resurrected bodies. Yeah, yeah. Paul Paul seems to affirm both. Right? He talks about this idea of man. I um I wish you know for the sake of my ministry and for the sake of my friends, I, I want to be here on earth. But I also sometimes wish in the midst of these struggles that I could depart and go to be with Christ, right? And that phrase is really all we get, go to be with Christ. We know that Paul also believes in resurrection of the body, but he was talking about going to be with Christ. And so a lot of smart theologians that I've read um, have only said just that. It's like there's this idea that no matter what happens, if I were to, my heart were to stop right now, that in some way, whether tangibly or intangibly, I would go to be with Christ. And I would be resurrected, whether that's eventual or whether because God exists out of time, I just find myself in the new kingdom. We don't know, but 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 we go to be with Christ <laughs> and we will be resurrected. Those two things are clear. Um, it's just how it works. It's a mystery. Yeah, so, um, you know, next week we're going to kind of talk about eschatology. Uh, we're going to do an overview of some of the different views. And we're also going to talk about the Great Commission because our leaning kind of it all ties together and it just I, we're going to wrap this up with talking about okay what does the christian life look like after salvation and what is it going to look like for eternity uh so we're going to address those things next week to kind of wrap up this season of you know a, a systematic theology which is you know barely even that i mean it was just we, we we started this season out with the idea of let's go by these topics and just work through them um and next season's gonna look a little different um maybe going back to our roots a little bit in some ways so uh, we're excited about it we've enjoyed it we've we hope that you have enjoyed it and um and it's hard to believe season three ends next week we're going to be taking a short break a very short break but a break nonetheless um, probably just two or three weeks um but we'll we'll keep you posted Eat. Gentlemen, thank you for your service to our country. Listeners, I hope you will join us next week for Theology Thursday.